the gravity of the time is such that every new avenue of peace, no matter how dimly discernible, should be explored. Never before in history has so much hope for so many people been gathered together in a single organization. You will provide a great share of the wisdom, of the courage, and the faith which can bring to this world lasting peace for all nations and happiness and well-being for all men. So we are here today with Bob Gallucci, who is the former U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for Political and Military Affairs. Bob, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure, Brad. Well, I'd love to, you know, uh, obviously it'd be great to capture your perspectives. I mean, with having such a career, like it's a real honor to have you on the show. But I'd first love to learn a little bit about you as a person, if that's okay. Can we start off with where were you born? <laughs> I, I Like a lot of people, I was born in Brooklyn, but I actually admit it. And uh, I, I grew up mostly on Long Island, went to uh, local public high school and schools, and then Went to the local university, Stony Brook, uh, State okay. University. Stony That's Brook. also my alma mater. Yeah, I, I I grew up in Baldwin. Where where town did you grow up in? Uh, Brentwood. Okay, great. Okay. Brentwood. Lifeguarded at, at Hexer State Park for three four years, uh, and did graduate work at uh, at Brandeis, M A and Ph D, and then had a start on an academic career teaching. And. Uh, and were there any formative experiences that you can relate to us that put you on that career path specifically? Yeah, I think it, it relevant to the conversation. I watched uh, another of your podcasts. I, I think you were at um, Johns Hopkins lab and uh, you were focused on the fallacy of the, of the, uh, uh, safety issues with uh, uh, nuclear energy. And I thought there was a parallel to the security issues, uh, international security issues. Uh, there are some fallacies there. And interestingly, <laughs> it seems like nuclear engineers are at the heart of both problems. Yeah. Uh, and maybe we can get to that. But I will, will let me say that I was uh, smitten very early on uh, with a kind of nuclear bug. I was, as a high schooler in the early 1960s, I was taken with uh, the concept of nuclear war, which was not common for my colleagues, but I think I was the first person to take a book out of the high school library by Herman Kahn entitled On Thermonuclear War. Uh, and it, it's, it, it uh, in a way, guided me through my undergraduate focus on foreign policy and national relations. And when I got to graduate school, and, and by that time, the Vietnam War was well underway uh, and uh, war and peace was in the air as you may have read you wouldn't remember but you may have read um, there was much protest over the war uh, much conversation and I ended up doing my PhD thesis uh, uh, on the conduct of the war the ground strategy and the air war uh, in in the war less than on the philosophical questions of whether this was in the national interest or not I, I thought it was not, but that was not the point of the of the book. But the the nuclear issue has remained with me, so that uh, when I began teaching, I focused on that. When I was teaching something other than general survey courses, I focused on nuclear deterrence and um, and the theory of deterrence. Uh, I got very interested in, in the way nuclear weapons work, uh, particularly simple ones. Uh, uh, and I ultimately ended up uh, doing something I'm still doing, which is consulting at Lawrence Livermore Labs uh, with something called Z Division, which some people know about. It's the intelligence portion of Lawrence Livermore and focuses on uh, nuclear issues of other countries. Um, and that, uh, through my uh, uh, career, after I left academia and went into government service, uh, I went into the arms control and disarmament agency and 
there I focused particularly on uh, nuclear energy issues, particularly nuclear proliferation, the spread of nuclear weapons to other countries. Uh, and so I, I, uh, that led me uh, sort of naturally at the time, this was the mid 70s, 1970s, it led me to focus on the nuclear fuel cycle, uh, which was not common for people in security affairs unless they were in the nonproliferation world. It turned out that the, uh, after the original five states acquired nuclear weapons, nobody else was announcing that they were pursuing nuclear weapons. They were all pursuing nuclear energy for nuclear power purposes. And uh, so if you think of the, the next four or five countries, um, uh, first uh, think about Israel, then think about India, think about Pakistan, think about North Korea, think about South Africa, none of their nuclear programs were nuclear weapons programs in a um, sort of de jure or announced fashion. They all were nuclear research or nuclear power programs. Uh, and so understanding the peaceful nuclear fuel cycle uh, seemed like a natural thing to do. And the arms control agency was uh, in a way set up uh, in a, a sort of a checks and balances way to balance what was then IRTA became Department of Energy um, where uh, we had the home of those who were um, enthusiastic about a full fuel cycle. I mean, that phrase, fuel cycle, um, for some people doesn't mean terribly a lot, but to those of us interested in the weapons danger, the security danger, if you embrace the cycle and you were insistent that we not waste that wonderful material plutonium, then you were in uh, in deep trouble. And if you could avoid that, you could be in no trouble at all. So I okay, found- so towards... I, just, I just want to take a pause there so everyone understands what you're saying. What you're saying is if you're not trying to eke every little bit of economics out of the fuel, it's not that hard to make it proliferation resistant. Let me put a, 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 a the answer is yes. <laughs> you said it much better than I did. No, I still need to like say two or three more times just to make sure I even fully, I try to make yeah. sure everyone's I mean, getting what we're saying. Yeah. If I fast forward from the 1970s to the 1990s, um, I was uh, uh, part of a team that negotiated with, led the team that negotiated with North Korea. And as we proceeded in those discussions, uh, which occurred in Geneva, um, the North Koreans at, at some point, somewhat to my amazement, the head of their delegation, uh, was, we were just having lunch, the two of us and our interpreters, said that, you know, this whole problem that, you're, that we're talking about could go away if you could help us get light water reactors. And I, I, you know, and I was stunned even to hear him use the phrase because they had a small um, graphite moderated reactor that was uh, a plutonium producer as many of them were. And that's what we were focused on in terms of where they would get the plutonium for their first weapons. And here he was saying that he had a problem. And that is that there was a nuclear establishment in North Korea and you can't just shut it down. I mean, I felt like I was talking to a colleague about the Atomic Energy Commission. Uh, it was interesting to me. And that's, and that's so incredible. Can actually I just pull on the sociological aspect of that for one quick sure. second before we get back to the technical? Um, this is gonna sound so naive. I almost like regret saying it out loud, but like <laughs> how do North Koreans know anything? about the outside world and like how stuff works, given how closed off they are. Here's the the, the problem with me answering that question. Uh, you may have noticed already that I'm old and my information is dated. So I'm talking about an exchange that happened 30 years ago. I see. So the closed offness of North Korea that I've always grown up with was not always the case, is what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it was closed off at the time. And the, the team that we negotiated with the North Korean side had very ill-fitting suits. And, you know, it looked they've looked very kind of Eastern European Asians, I mean, in a, in a funny sort of way. That's not true anymore. They have been around and they are and, and, and Kim Jong-un, the grandson uh, the son of the guy who was running. Actually, when I started the negotiations, it was the current leader's grandfather, Kim Il-sung, who, who ran North Korea. 
this is not the same country. It's a different country now. And it's not a country I know terribly well. But there are a lot of people around who do know it well. It's not the hermit kingdom anymore. Lots of people have been there. I have never been to North Korea. I negotiated with them for two years. Um, pretty <laughs> hand to hand contact. Um, but uh, I I don't know the modern North Korean state terribly well. I read a lot. I know what I can do from that, but I don't have the contact I did at the time. At, at the time, your image would have fit fine, but you would have to revise it to capture the current reality of North Korea as I've come to uh, understand it. But you're saying even back then, they knew enough and had enough contact with the outside world to understand and communicate that a light water reactor was inherently, you know, it, Proliferation Here, here's what Kung Suk, Kung Suk Ju was the dep, uh, deputy foreign minister, and he was my negotiating partner. He led the North Korean delegation. What he said, this is not, I can't say this is a quote, but it's something like, look, we know that you have the most modern technology. I mean, he didn't say that Westinghouse licensed uh, Framaton for the French uh, and uh, GE did Siemens for the Germans. Right? I mean, he didn't do that, but he knew that the designs that were American designs back in the day uh, when we were building reactors, as you well know, uh, that we had the technology. Uh, and it, it became an issue I've, after, I, I mean, I, it was very much of a struggle for me to, to send the reporting cable back, back that night and get on the telephone with a couple of undersecretaries, one an undersecretary of defense, the other an undersecretary of state, two very smart guys whom I had known for a long time, but they were really worried that I had lost it somehow and had something bad to drink because they, they said, wait a minute, you want to help the North Koreans get nuclear power reactors? I said, they said, you got to be kidding. And I said, no, you don't understand. And I, with all due respect, you guys, you don't know about nuclear energy and you don't know that nuclear power, if you're just talking about the reactor, is not risky from a security perspective. Yeah. So, um, though, like Eisenhower kind of knew that because he was the one who was like, let's give everyone little reactors to yeah. in, well, for peace. And I understand the reactors he gave them actually could have different uses, but at least the philosophy of we want to give people nuclear technology so it becomes a peaceful technology and not a weapons technology had, had been floating around for a while, right? Yeah, you've got the phrase atoms for peace, you know, but you got to remember when you do this, because I, I, I got to worry a little bit here uh, because I fought against uh, what was first the Atomic Energy Commission, then ERDA, and then the Department of Energy because of their continuing enthusiasm for a full fuel cycle for recovering the plutonium and yeah. for using it in the current generation of reactors and much worse, a new generation uh, that weren't thermal reactors, they were gonna be fast reactors. And yeah, we I'm against all this too, by the way. I think you and I are probably on the exact same page. I'm like, I just don't see the economic, given how, especially today, how cheap it is to mine <laughs> your normal uranium, get it to 5%. I just don't, nobody can argue to me the case for completing the fuel cycle on with, like, with a mathematical model. I just, I don't see, it. I don't see it. I'm sorry, I don't see it. No, well, you shouldn't see it. It's not there, but it also hasn't been. And, you know, as as the costs rise of a full fuel cycle and of the of reprocessing, which is, you know, we know countries are, Russia is still reprocessing, still trying thermal recycle. I don't know exactly where the Japanese are now after their Fukushima experience, but um, there's still some enthusiasm out there. And there's still a worry uh, that I have that we're going to rediscover uh, the recovery of plutonium, and I don't. I, I think that is the is the is the risky part. And if we could yeah. stick to thermal reactors, once yeah. through, store spent fuel, um, yeah. you've got you know the way you were arguing about the safety, you know, and in my mind, of course, the the, uh, the loss of coolant accident, the China syndrome, all that is what informed us back in the day. And it all came from the nuclear engineers. Well, where does the full fuel cycle come from and the need to recover plutonium? And it comes from those engineers who see the elegance of a closed fuel cycle. Yes. Well, forgive me, but its elegance is overcome by the risks that are associated with it. Yeah, and well, I mean, I think not to like bash on engineers too much because I come from that cloth also. And also, by the way, find like I'm actually quite sympathetic because I fall, I find myself falling victim to the exact same 
mentality of this like drive towards optimization for optimization's sake with where whereas here's the problem it's actually bad engineering because good engineering actually is a more complex optimization it's not an optimization across a single variable which is fuel economics mm -hmm. it's optimization across multiple varial multiple variables with your desired um outcome probably being lowest cost of energy at least that's my desired outcome and if you were to look at it from that perspective, you would not over-optimize your reactor. You would optimize on things like constructability or availability of supply chain or availability of material right. or de-risking right. um, investment through standardization. Like those are the things you can still be a good engineer and optimize across different variables, but it's just very tempting and alluring to pick one and just drive towards perfection on that. So I, I'm sympathetic, but it is a problem. It is a problem. It, it it is a problem, and I and uh, when I have visited uh, other schools with that have engineering schools that where I teach now, Georgetown University does not have an engineering school, but I've been to engineering schools elsewhere and other universities, and that instinct to recover plutonium is still there. I mean, it is still there, and even the um, the urge uh, to design reactors that would require highly enriched uranium is still there. Yeah. And none of this is necessary. We, I mean, you can settle at 3.5% as an enrichment level uh, and in, the enrichment services can be had on the open market. There's no reason to spread the technology around any further than it already is. Yep. So you can, uh, I would say that the uh, I was prepared for the battle, uh, which I had to fight for the deal that I cut with the North Koreans and we ultimately accepted with the North Koreans. I was prepared for the attack from the right, uh, that you know, you're know you naive, you're trying to do a deal with North Korea, and only, only understand. Yeah, so what force. was the outcome of that battle? Can you explain that battle and what the outcome yeah, was? Well, that, I mean, there were those who, uh, when I went to, to the Hill, particularly both in the Senate and the House, to, to defend what was called the agreed framework with North Korea. Uh, and I explained that, you know, we are crushing their plutonium program. It's gonna end. We're gonna shut down their one site and at that time, there was one site, Yangbyun, and it, it, it will be no more. And we'll be replacing them with safe, proliferation resistant, you know, like the wristwatch isn't waterproof, it's water resistant. Well, the, the light water reactors are proliferation resistant. If, if there is no reprocessing plant, there's no recovery of the plutonium, there is no proliferation risk from the light water reactor. And indeed, the requirement for enrichment means that if you don't permit enrichment in the country, they are forever dependent upon an international yep. market. So yep. this is a this is a good deal from a proliferation perspective. However, if you start from well, wait a minute, I don't like deals to deal to deal with a problem like North Korea. I'd much rather a military solution. I said actually, you wouldn't. You do not want to go to war with North Korea. We've we've done that. You know, it, it and, really and wasn't also, that. I, have you ever been to a, a subway in South Korea? Something that stood out to me was they have gas masks at every subway stop because they are on alert for a war with North Korea. That does well, not I've, seem pleasant. If you lived in Seoul, you would be on alert too. I mean, the 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 rhetoric that comes out of Pyongyang and it's coming out right now, as a matter of fact, is awful, yeah. right? And it it is provocative, and it when you live as close to the DMZ to that border with North Korea as you as you are when you are in Seoul, you you don't take these things lightly and you don't dismiss them. Yeah. So this is a serious security issue. So the idea that we were going to try to solve it by providing North Korea with two thousand megawatt light water reactors, uh, initially that North Koreans would not accept South Korean reactors. And I explained that a lot of countries want to provide these reactors, but nobody wants to pay for them. The South Koreans will do it. South Koreans took on the most of the burden. The Japanese agreed to take on an, an, a part of that, that burden. So that's what the deal was for the agreed framework. But the argument that I was referring to before, before was with both the right and the left. The right, just simple I don't like deals as a method of, of solving a problem with North Korea. I'd much rather a military solution. My answer is no, you wouldn't if you knew what you were talking about. Yeah. Second, the attack from the left came from those who, who are in the nonproliferation community for whom I have great affection uh, and respect. But 
uh, it stops at the water's edge because they turn out to be against nuclear energy, against nuclear power because of the association for decades with the proliferation of nuclear weapons. And I said, I, I got it. And they, it, I mean, I, one of my critics, who's actually quite a good friend, you know, pointed out that the amount of plutonium produced in 2000 megawatt light water reactor was enormous compared to what that little um, graphite moderated research reactor could produce. So we'd be giving them huge plutonium production. And I said, absolutely true, but no way to separate the plutonium from the spent fuel, no way to enrich their own uranium. So we've got them. It's yeah. fun. Yeah. I mean, the, the argument that I always have to clarify to people is plutonium is not one thing you have, you know, your fissile plutonium 239, that's what you got to worry about. But then the natural buildup of plutonium 240 in a light water reactor is essentially a poison that prevents you from using that plutonium 239. So it's like, that's what's so great about a light water reactor. Oh, I'm pausing. No. Greta, it is with great reservation that I am going to disagree with you. But no, please, no. Educate, I have to, because your, your argument, uh, I, I last confronted full-blown from someone from Kojima, from the French side of this, and it was at a one the first uh, meeting that the Obama administration had on nuclear terrorism and the security issue with nuclear energy. And the French were making the argument that the reprocessing is not a problem because it's a self-limiting thing for for the uh, uh, terrorist concern. Mm. That's not true. Now, it's the reason it's not true cannot be fully explained outside of a classified environment, okay, okay. but it's not true. In other words, the, when I teach this, uh, I start with where you started, uh, you know, that there are different isotopes of plutonium which have a different uh, propensity uh, to spontaneously emit neutrons and therefore uh, create different kinds of problems for the nuclear weapons designer. And high quality plutonium, if you're a weapons designer, is in fact much like highly enriched uranium. It's highly enriched in the, it's not enriched, but it's it's highly focused on plutonium-239 rather than the even isotopes. And that means low burn up fuel. That does not mean a light water reactor. Got it. Understand. The next thing that should be said, however, is that all plutonium is fissile. You all all isotopes are fissile. If you ask the question, can you design a bomb with any plutonium? The answer is yes. And you need to understand that no one can uh, no one can go any further than I just did. Uh, okay. I don't think um, yeah. I've, I've I've been around the block on this. I can't explain why. Can't talk about why. But we worry about all plutonium, not just the high quality stuff that okay. the weapons designer would most like to have. Okay, that was a little unsatisfying to not get the details, but maybe uh, when we step into a classified environment, I can learn a little bit more on this one. Yeah. Um, okay, fair enough. Uh, so then what you're saying is, um, so then what's the method by which you would secure, let's say you gave them two gigawatt scale, actually, First, start off with the conclusion. How, how did those negotiations end? And then I'll get back we, to the I mean, we, we we concluded the negotiations. I signed for the United States of America. Kang Sek Ju signed for the DPRK, the, the, the formal name of North Korea. And that was done in 1994. And for the next seven, eight years uh, into the early Bush administration, nothing happened at Yangbyon. There was no work on plutonium. That's the good news. What they agreed to do there, they did. The bad news is they were hedging. They secretly made a deal with the Pakistanis. You may have heard about the AQ Khan network yeah. and uh, initially transfer of gas centrifuge technology, ultimately the transfer of, of, we understand, actually gas centrifuge equipment from Pakistan, from that network to North Korea. So that uh, the Clinton administration became aware of this secret activity but decided not to tell the North Koreans we knew what they were doing. And then and the plan was at the early part of the Gore administration, which you may have noticed we didn't actually reach, uh, the plan was to go and confront the North Koreans. There was something called the Perry process led by former Secretary of Defense Perry, 
in a review of our policy with North Korea, and that endorsed the idea of continuing uh, because at that point in the late 90s, technology had been passed, but we didn't think there was actually any construction, as best I re remember, there was any construction of a gas centrifuge plant. Early in the Bush administration, of course, they were briefed by the Clinton folks. Um, they looked at this and they decided to let it go as well until really the, um, I guess it was the summer of uh, of 2001, uh, the uh, the Bush people decided that too much stuff was being transferred, and they sent an Assistant Secretary of State um, Kelly uh, to uh, Pyongyang, and he confronted the North Koreans with our knowledge of their, uh, to put it bluntly, their cheating, uh, and the, the North Koreans uh, denied it, uh, kind of denied it, um, and uh, we stopped the construction of the reactors. There was something called Keto, the uh, Korean Energy Development Organization that had been created with the South Koreans and the United States uh, and the Japanese to build those reactors that were called for a decade earlier when we did the agreed framework. And we stopped that construction. As soon as we stopped the construction in January of the next year, the North Koreans said, fine, you're stopping construction. We're out of the deal. We're gonna build nuclear weapons and test them. And indeed, in 2004, they tested, or 2006, they tested their first nuclear weapon. And they did this all with the gas centrifuge? Uh, or Gas centrifuge. Gas, gas centrifuge. And now, then, it, yeah. I mean, and, they had, of course, eventually, as they do now, they have both um, highly enriched uranium from their gas centrifuge program, and they started up the uh, research reactor again. Uh, research uh, young gun. Right, because I, was that, Iran has... A real power reactor, right? In addition, yeah, to but Iran is an interesting counter case because yeah. Iran had a structure that was to be built by the Germans, and in the Iran Iraq war, it was bombed. Um, the Russians came in and said, "We'll finish that reactor." Actually, what they did is build a whole new reactor for the for the Iranians, and it has been operating. But it is a light water reactor. Um, and that's not what, did, and that's why we blow up their centrifuges because they're not using the light water reactor for weapons who's, production. Who's, we haven't blown up anybody's centrifuges. Um, I mean, we we somebody did. Blew is, up, somebody blew up some, or not blew them up, but spun them out of control or something. Okay. Yes. Yes. You're talking about messing with them. That's yes. Was, who exactly did that? The Israelis, the Americans. Uh, the Ugandans, the you know, who knows? But but the point the point is nobody blew anything up. But our concern about the centrifuges was reflected in the JCPOA, the deal we cut 2015 with the Iranians, which, um, in his wisdom, uh, President Trump pulled us out of, and we've been trying to regenerate that because we'd like to stop that enrichment program. But, but I guess what I'm saying is. The, the the real learning here is that they feel like they need to build the centrifuges because they can't use their light water reactor to produce weapons grade material. Yeah, if well, two could, things are true. Would, and then they wouldn't need the centrifuges. That's that's right, sort of. I mean, I think that's 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 not bad reasoning, but I'm not sure it's the the causal connections are as you describe them. The reasoning's okay. right. The the what the Iranians did. Um, somewhat to our confusion, was they began uh, producing, um, uh, building a heavy water production facility. Now, oh. this was this was interesting to us because they had no heavy water reactor. The Russians had built them a light water reactor, a Russian style light water reactor. They had no heavy water reactor, but they were building a reactor. And we were concerned that that reactor would be a source of plutonium. So as part of the JC, JCPOA, they had to redesign that reactor so it produced less plutonium and less of concern and had to exclude the cre the manufacture of a reprocessing facility that might have extracted the plutonium from any spent fuel that came out of the reactor how do you how do these negotiations happen between our scientists here and their scientists there in terms of communicating enough technical information to stop something from happening without that information that's being communicated, teaching them how to do something. I mean, I think what you have to accept is that um, countries 
that are serious about a nuclear weapons program. And I would put North Korea and Iran in that category. They both are quite serious about their nuclear weapons program. Both countries have had longstanding nuclear weapons programs. They know a lot, right? It's not like we're about to teach them something in the negotiation. And they understand when we say you can't do X, they understand why. Okay, they we don't it. want them to do X. So and, it, and it, how, it how does, what how once you have the enriched material, is there another hard part in terms of making the bomb? Or once you have the enriched material, it's easy from there right. on out. If you if you if you just took made this simple, you got two things to make a bomb. You gotta have your fissile material and you gotta have a triggering package. The triggering package can look like a ball, it can look like a tube. It depends on what your fissile material is what the package is gonna look like and how sophisticated it is. But a country like Iran needed to do two things. Any country would and Iran did, needed to have a whole program to build that implosion system because they were going for the an implosion system because it's much more efficient than the gun type device that we first dropped on Hiroshima. Uh, the bomb that we dropped on Nagasaki was an implosion system. It looked like a soccer ball kind of in its configuration. So they had a whole program uh, involving high explosives, a lighting system, as they call it, or electrical system, uh, and other elements of that implosion system. On the one hand, which you can use a dummy in the, as a replacement for the fissile material, and then you have quite separately a program to develop fissile material. And if it's going to be gas centrifuge, it's got to go to high levels, and there are other ways of doing it, but right now the technology of choice, whether it's commercial or whether it's for bombs, is a gas centrifuge. It's not gaseous diffusion anymore for either. Yeah, got it, got it, got it. Okay, so um, um, what? So what are I guess what are you? Sorry, if we could just come back to the light water reactors and how they're proliferation Please. resistant. Then, if not due to the ice topic difference what is the like what what is the um is it just it's hard to remove the plutonium from the rest of the ceramic pellets is, yeah. is that i the mean challenge? let's let's think about this for a moment if you have a small research reactor like the north koreans do and it's a, a gas graphite reactor not only you know for your point do you have low burn up fuel you can pull that fuel out you know whenever you want to right you just move the machine over the top, pull out some rods, and, and you go and, and do the chemical separation to pull the plutonium out. Got it. But think is what I would I was trying to tell the senators and congressmen when I was testifying, defending the deal. Think about what a light water reactor, a thousand megawatt reactor looks like. It's a huge, bloody thing. And it has fuel assemblies that weigh tons. And it has a big fuel machine. The reactor has to shut down yeah, in yeah. order to pull the fuel assemblies out. So no one's going to sneak off with the plutonium. Right, but right? they just after the first couple of years, then they've got them sitting in a spent fuel pool. You're saying they're not a risk there, or they are a risk there, or we would take they're, it. They're after. they are in the pool, but you know what do you what do you've got? You've got fuel assemblies that are made. I mean, what is the the metal they're encased in? They're it's common. Titanium, right? There's it, it, zirconium, and and the zirconium uh, has to be chopped up. The material has to be leached out. It's a messy chemical process. You can't build a reprocessing plant to to deal with light water reactors spent fuel without everybody in the universe knowing you're doing it. I, not I gonna so, so what off. you're saying is getting the plutonium out of the pellet in a way that it's usable and chemically distinct, even if it's not isotopically distinct, is still an extremely advanced, sophisticated, difficult process. And it will take years. Yeah. And everybody will know you're doing it. And the yeah. international community can respond. Yeah. And by the way, they can also shut down your reactor by turning off your access to enrich uranium if you don't have a re an enrichment facility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, got it, got it, got it. Okay. Um, and then I think we should just the other thing that I personally just think is the greatest fallacy in terms of these advanced reactors is the thorium-based fuel cycle because there you are intentionally separating U two thirty three, which, as far as I know, is even worse than plutonium when it comes to 
It's yeah, uh, I, how much you need first to make a bomb. Is, is that your understanding as well that the thorium thing is a total nightmare? I, uh, to my knowledge, you know, the only country that has run with a the idea of running a, th a thorium based U two thirty three recovery is India, and that's because they have you know so much thorium. Uh, it's not the only country that could, but it's the only country that has, I think, moved very far down the road, but they still haven't moved very far down. I mean, you still have to do lots of things that are different uh, than you would do it if it was a uranium-based system. Uh, and I don't think there's much of an angle in it from the Indian perspective, either for a thermal thorium fuel cycle, for recovery of U-233, for the, their nuclear weapons program, which is really based on uh, plutonium, um, and they have reactors that are dedicated for plutonium production for their weapons program, uh, and separate reactors, which are for the generation of electricity and are inspected by the IAEA. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's a dead end, too, just from an economics perspective, but a lot of people advocate for it. And then I just am like, well, it doesn't make any sense to produce a bunch of U-233. Like, that doesn't make any sense. I, I don't think, I mean, it's like, it's like a lot of ideas that are floating around, you know, that attract the attention of everyone from Bill Gates to, <laughs> to your next door neighbor who, you know, hears about a traveling wave or a molten yeah. salt or some other kind of thing. And my own view here, which is not, I'm not a technical person. Uh, my own view is that uh, if we could keep it simple, uh, we will be much better off. We'll be better off in terms of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and we'll be much better off in, in terms of safety and in every other way. And if we can keep spent fuel as spent fuel and not open it up, uh, we can do what, you know, back in the day when we were still talking enthusiastically about the full fuel cycle, the Canadians, who of course are running heavy water reactors that can do reactor, they were putting the spent fuel at, at white shell in these cylinders, these cement cylinders, the same cement cylinders that we have to make bigger because our fuel assemblies are bigger, that we are putting spent fuel in co-located at the reactor. So we're rediscovering something that's 50 years old, essentially that the Canadians have been doing all, all along because there's no angle for the Canadians to separate the plutonium. So the question was, what do they do with their spent fuel after they take it out of the pond? They put it in, in cement. Well, how long will the cement last? A long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I never understood. The whole waste thing is just another thing. It makes absolutely no sense. But, you know, it's, I, I think, uh, I just wanted to add maybe a fine point on, I think, something we're both saying when we, like, crit critique the nuclear engineer's enthusiasm. I think it's, um, I think it's all incentive-based. I, I don't think people realize they're doing it, but I think, like, the incentives drive it. So, like, People who are grant funded at universities to study solutions for nuclear waste, you know, and then develop an expertise in how do you make nuclear waste last a million years, they don't want to say that nuclear waste isn't really a problem or doesn't need to be solved for a million years, because that's how they fund their research is making it an ever more difficult problem. And then it goes beyond the academics. Then it goes to industry when industry wants to collect some of those decommissioning funds, that rich, you know, $50 billion pot or, or to study Yucca Mountain for what, you know, why a million years? Oh, because it's going to be a really hard problem to solve. That means a lot of money for the people who are going to solve it. And, and, but I don't actually think the individuals realize that they're caught up in this trap. I think it's just all incentive driven. And then they rationalize based on like these incentives that they've been driven towards through their whole career. I'm prepared to believe that's true. I not being, one of those people myself, I don't know what it feels like to them, but I know that it's frustrating if you're not technical and you look at this and someone tells you, I'm imagining some judge who's being told in a court case what a half-life is and the half-life of the actinides are 20,000 years. And all of a sudden, well, you got to have a 20,000 year solution to this problem. I mean, it, you, you end up making it non-solvable. I know. I know, I know, I know. That's why my, at least my communication strategy has been like radically shift the Overton window to the point where, because people, yeah, a judge or anyone or policymaker is not going to understand, not going to take the time to understand technical arguments. And even if they do, they might not be convinced because like the social aspects or just the fact that more people close to them are telling them something different might overrule their own like 
technical understanding of it as hard fought as that would be to gain. And so, I mean, my thinking has just been, you just have to shift the Overton window. You just have to, with the most confidence humanly possible, say we need not just 100% nuclear, we need 200% nuclear. The light water reactors are the simplest, easiest, most proven thing. They're awesome. Let's just do tens of thousands of gigawatts of them. And then people read that emotionally. And that's a more convincing argument rather than saying, here is how a light water reactor works. <laughs> so let me ask you, I, 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 is it okay for me to ask you a question? Yeah, so sure. I, I, I heard you make the argument for S, what I think are called SMRs, uh, small modular reactors. Yeah. And I, I'm, this all sounds good to me, but I, I generally think I want something that's really, really, really easy for the NRC to license. And I, I what I wondered about was whether uh, you thought this would be easy to license if you if you downscale. And I can understand why capital costs of these large reactors and who's building reactor vessels, as you correctly point out these days. So you might end up with something smaller. But is there a licensing issue with a with a smaller uh, vanilla light water reactor? Okay, yeah. So maybe let me lay out maybe a, a few different components to my answer. Um, the first is that I am actually a big fan of, of big reactors too. I just think that the nuclear industry has lost its way in terms of the institutional knowledge necessary to do things cost effectively. And so mm -hmm. in order to build back up that knowledge, you need to do the same thing over and over and over again. And in order to do the same thing over and over and over again, given today's like capital market constraints, the best way to do it is start small. So uh -huh. build a thousand small reactors and then you can build a thousand big reactors. That's like my general philosophy on why small first. Um, that now, now let me come to the licensability issue. The licensability issue with the NRC is totally distinct from the licensability issue globally. The NRC in their entire operating history, you know, 47 years, or actually I should say 48 years now, um, has never seen a full application through from start to finish ever. Ever. Not a single nuclear installation in this country was licensed by the NRC. Every single one of them were grandfathered in from um, the Atomic Energy Commission. And Vogel will be the first that has started with the NRC and will come online with the NRC. Um, so there's a big licensability issue with the NRC, irrespective of your technology. Let's start with that. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the global licensing consideration, I believe that small light water reactors are the easiest because... It's a technology that they're already intimately familiar with, that we have a lot of operating experience with. However, you can vary um, many of your, uh, let's say, um, safety margins and ratios to create uh, better scenarios. So for instance, if you have a smaller core, but still a bunch of steel in your reactor vessel around it, the amount of energy that is necessary to melt through that vessel proportional to the vessel thickness is much better in an SMR scenario. And so it's just mm -hmm. much easier to prove things um, or have longer time periods to move energy from point A to point B with a small light water reactor um, to the international licensing community. That's my thesis. Uh huh. Makes sense. Makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Um, but no, I think, um, listen, I, yeah, I think we need tens of thousands of gigawatts. I think that we can make thousands of s small reactors on the way to make thousands of medium reactors on the way to make tens of thousands of large reactors. Uh, and I think that's the pathway to like fully overhaul Earth's energy supply in a couple decades. I like the argument that should appeal to anybody concerned about climate change that you can't get whatever you think is really possible with renewables it's not possible in the next couple of decades and unless something dramatic happens that i the way i have learned about this with batteries there is no way to provide base load other than nuclear without a a a, a carbon problem Oh, well, totally. And I think um, the other component there is, I mean, the renewables industry has done such a good job branding themselves as the only problem is cost. And look at how well we're doing on the cost decline and look at how well batteries will follow in our footsteps. So that's their branding. What they're failing to ignore uh, or they're failing to represent, I should say, what they are ignoring is that 
on a per energy delivered basis, you are using a thousand times as much material uh, to for this like battery renewable combo as nuclear would. So although you're calling yourselves low carbon, you're not zero carbon. And when you add in the the carbon footprint of storage and carbon footprint of renewables, it's not. I mean, it's yeah, it's bit, it's about four times better than combined cycle natural gas, but it's not nothing. So mm-hmm. like you're you still got a carbon problem. Like you're not you're not solving the problem that you set out to solve. <laughs> so, but yeah, nuclear solves all that. Um, but we just have to get over this stag this great stagnation. I'm for that. All right. Um, any other? Um, you're the guest, so I should get off my podium. <laughs> Uh, what are the thoughts? What do you want to leave our audience with? Um, if there are reasons why we haven't had reactor starts in the United States over the last bunch of decades, um, it, usually the reasons that people allude to are safety first. Um, sometimes that's spread to not only operation of the reactor, but waste and security. Um, and I think what you have been doing is a is a very good job of addressing uh, the first couple. And what I would want people to understand is that there is such a thing as, from the perspective of international security, safe nuclear power. Uh, one has to be careful about what one does, but that doesn't mean we can't. Uh, and we have at least one negotiated agreement that did just that with respect to light water reactors. And that would have been a fine solution uh, had the North Koreans not cheated on the enrichment area, uh, but they did. Uh, and so it was uh, not the solution. But I think um, I, w- I would want people to understand that uh, running away from nuclear energy is a mistake. They need to understand a little bit more about it uh, and it is not as mysterious as people make it out. I mean, I teach this course to undergraduates and to, to graduate students the first half of the course. We don't talk about countries. It's only technology. It's the nuclear fuel cycle. It's the design of nuclear weapons. It's the intersection of those things. And uh, the case I want to make is that you can, uh, you need to be careful with nuclear energy, but uh, you can produce safe a uh, uh, nuclear establishment uh, that will deliver uh, the kind of energy you want without the carbon footprint. Bob Galucci, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. And initiate at least a new approach to the many difficult problems that must be solved in both private and public conversation. If the world is to take off the inertia imposed by fear and is to make positive progress for peace.